The Oblates of St. Augustine was founded by Father John Melnick, formerly a member of the Order of St. Augustine and of the Pontifical Commission Ecclesia Dei. Father John's dream was to defend and preserve the traditional Augustinian charism against the attacks from modernist bishops seeking to destroy the traditional Catholic faith and religious life. Beginning during the months in 2020, when Catholic bishops made it nearly impossible to attend Mass and receive the last rites, Father John founded the Oblates of St. Augustine to preach the traditional Catholic faith, provide the sacraments according to the traditional Roman rite, and live the traditional Augustinian religious life to merit grace for the world. Living a mendicant charism, the Oblates of St. Augustine is supported entirely by the alms of its generous benefactors. You can visit our website to learn more about how you can support this mission at www.westonmonks.org. God bless you. Because thou hast seen me, Thomas, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and have believed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. What does it mean to have faith? What does it mean to believe? This is a question that pertains not only to those who acknowledge the gift of faith in their lives, but also those that don't. Because this is a question that pertains to our humanity, to our experience as persons and pertains to fundamental questions every person must ask themselves, such as, what is happiness? And where do I find it? If we look at our lives, our experience, we become aware of two dimensions. The first dimension is the exterior dimension. This is the dimensions where we have most of our experiences because it's the exterior about which we have more awareness. The weather outside, whether it's sunny, rainy, cloudy, windy, our health, whether we're in good shape, whether we have stomach issues, heart issues, uh, pneumonia, or we're perfectly fit. Or we're, we're experiencing trials, like at work, when we're doing everything according to the book, but the income seems not to be coming in. There is a part of our lives in which we accumulate experiences, whether they're good or bad. We think a, we think a life is full whenever our lives are full of experiences, when we've collected all the experiences possible to not miss out on a single joy. We think that we can content ourselves in this exterior dimension alone, where if we can manage to control every aspect of this part of life, we will be satisfied, content, and happy. If I can decide where to work, what to do for work, where to study, who to love, what to wear, what perfume to buy, where to go for vacation, where to live, how big or how small my house, what car I drive. We are under the delusion that we are free, that we are exercising our freedom just because everything seems to be under our control. We believe we are the sum of our experiences, good or bad, and this is the delusion we allow ourselves to be under, that we are whatever happens to us, making who we are the product of chance, or fortune. If good things happen to me, I'm happy. If bad things happen to me, I'm unhappy. But the truth lies in realizing there is yet another dimension of our lives, the interior dimension. Why is interiority important? Because interiorly, it doesn't matter what is happening to you exteriorly. What matters is the meaning you give to what is happening to you exteriorly. If something good happens to you in the interior life, you attach to it a meaning. If something bad happens to you in the interior life, you attach to it another meaning. But none of us are satisfied with just attaching meaning to the individual events in our lives. But in discovering the true meaning of our entire life, of our existence, of our being here and now. And when we become accustomed, and, and when we become accustomed to the fact that each event of our lives that happens exteriorly is attached to a meaning interiorly, we become aware that our lives are truly meaningful, 
full of meaning. When we know that some sort of trial in our lives has meaning, we find the courage to persevere. This is why our society doesn't want us to discover within ourselves this interior dimension. They give us iPods or iPhones so we can put our, put our earphones in and listen to music as we travel so that we don't ever spend time reflecting interiorly on the meaning of the events in our lives. If we only live exteriorly, then we will constantly be looking for something fulfilling because we will constantly be unfulfilled. It's the unhappy people that make for a great economy because they're the ones constantly buying and selling and buying and moving and selling and moving. When a person is happy, he rejoices in the little he has and in what he doesn't have. Happiness is just a little detail for him. He doesn't need quantity. He's satisfied with the profound meaning and quality of the one thing he has. In a world that wants us to focus on exterior material things, it's difficult to talk about faith and believing. But so many people have become used to being unhappy interiorly that they've accepted the attitude of just changing their exterior circumstances to get as close as possible to the unattainable ideal, happiness. When our Lord encountered a paralytic in Bethsaida, our Lord approached him and asked, do you want to be healed? The paralytic gave excuses. Master, there's this pool here that someone could come and take me whenever it, whenever it sprouts and I could be healed, but no one ever comes and, t and takes me. Whenever I try to get up myself or to, to crawl over there myself, somebody else goes, rushes in and, and takes the, the event for healing. He blames other people and the circumstances for his remaining sick and paralyzed instead of giving our Lord a, a simple answer. Yes, I want to be healed. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be happy? Do you want to enjoy your life? Do you want peace for your restlessness? Do you want to truly experience the profound meaning of your life? We've all become experts at analyzing all that makes us unhappy, but we're unable to realize what causes us to come out of that state of unhappiness. Therefore, the first thing that needs to awaken within each of us is the desire to be happy, not the desire to content ourselves with material pleasures that distract us from the deeper desire for happiness, which is what we usually settle for instead. A life that is full of meaning, not a life where we try to hang on to control so we can avoid what causes us stress, anxiety, and wounds. Regardless of our efforts, there are things in life that can completely take away our hope in a materially fortunate life, which ex extinguishes our desire to be happy, causing us to live within the boundaries of our fears. We want to remain on that stretcher like the paralytic, telling the story of all the great things we've suffered as if simply having suffered them makes us honorable and worthy of praise. Until we understand these two things, that life isn't only what is exterior, life is not only the events that happen to us, but is also the meaning of these events, until we realize this, our Lord has little to say to us. Because faith is not the same thing as interiority, but interiority is the road that leads us to faith. That is, if a man doesn't know where, if a man doesn't know there is a world inside of him, or if he's afraid to go inside himself because he's afraid of what he knows he will find, how is he ever supposed to encounter God? If we aren't aware of this world within us, or if we refuse to live in this world, God has to employ other means to invite us in. When we suffer, we often ask ourselves, why is there suffering? What meaning does this experience of pain that I am going through have? When we are living a difficult moment in our lives, we're placed before a very important question, and that question is about meaning. One of the problems we have with this interiority is that we think this interiority is some sort of technique. But all we need from going within ourselves is to acknowledge our fundamental desire for happiness and that this desire is precisely to look for something other than ourselves, 
We cannot make ourselves happy. We cannot be our own solution. We need another. We need someone. Capital S. The people that are placed in our lives were precisely placed in our lives to lead us to this someone. In the scriptures, our Lord talks to two different people. They ask him the same question. Lord, when did we see you? And our Lord says, you saw me when you visited the imprisoned, when you fed the sick, or when you fed the hungry, when you clothed the naked, when you healed the sick. And the others said, Lord, when would you see you? What were we supposed to see you? In the sick, in the poor, in the hungry, in the imprisoned. But both of them asked the same question because they, were, they both were both unaware. Lord, when did we see you? The gift of faith is not the gift to see things, but the gift to know that there is more to the things we see. And God uses every circumstance we experience for a more profound purpose, to take us from the exterior to the interior, to take us from temporal things to eternal things. Prayer, then, isn't a self-help technique where we think we can achieve for ourselves that which was never meant to be achieved alone. Insert our Lord. Our Lord sends his disciples to those who are burdened, burdened with physical illnesses as well as spiritual, to those whose lives are not going according to plan, whose lives are not completely in their own control, and announce to them the kingdom of God is at hand, to announce that these burdens have a more profound meaning and purpose. On his way to heal the daughter of Jairus, our Lord passes through a crowd. In this crowd, there is a woman with a hemorrhage. She says to herself, if only I could touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. So in her illness, 12 years with his hemorrhage, with his wound, she pushes through the crowd just to touch a little piece of our Lord's cloak. When she does so, when she's achieved her goal, she's healed, and our Lord feels power going from him and turns to look and asks, who touched me? And of course, after receiving this this wonderful miracle, this healing, the objective of her goal, she becomes scared, frightened. And because of this, she has a direct face-to-face encounter with our Lord. This woman would later on die, just as Lazarus, after having been raised from the dead, also dies. So the miracle here isn't necessarily one of merely physical healing. Something else would take her life later on. The miracle isn't her healing, but that her wound, her illness, was the catalyst, was the motive, was the reason that led to an encounter with our incarnate Lord himself. Often what we think is a disgrace can become the greatest grace of all, that which causes a face-to-face encounter with our Lord. We are of the mind that only beautiful things can lead us to God, but also ugly things can lead us to God. At this point, what is the gift of faith? To look into the eyes of our Lord, this face-to-face encounter. From that moment forward, the life of that woman wasn't just a life that was healed, but a life that was saved. She saw salvation's face. In search for a solution to her problem, she didn't just find a solution to all of her temporal problems. You know, thinking, oh, my car will always work fine. I'll never have to go to the mechanic again. All my relationships now will be easy because I'll just live according to the moral law and everybody will be nice to me and so I'll just you know, smile and enjoy and laugh and, and because we're all living the gospel, we'll, just, we'll, we'll never experience pain again. She encountered salvation. That means that anything can happen to you in life, good or bad, because that which you need, you already have. The world has every reason to keep you from being happy to keep you from falling in love with our Lord, to dedicating much of your time to interiority, to prayer, to speaking with our Lord, from intentionally growing an affection for him. Unhappy and frustrated people are easy to control. 
You can control them by satisfying their base passions, their lusts, their artificial desires. Sometimes in, in vocational discernment conversations, some t uh, people will bring up a motive. They believe some people become priests or religious, that they couldn't accomplish anything in their life, that somehow this was a, a way to, to status or to do something, something with your life that you, you couldn't achieve before. I mean, how easy is it con to control someone who isn't making a lot of money, is working very hard, and there's very little fruit from, from it? You could easily lure them in. Hey, come work for me. I'm making a lot more money. Give up what you have. Come, come, over, come over and follow me, follow me. Very easy to manipulate people that are unhappy and frustrated. But our Lord didn't do this when he called Peter. Our Lord told Peter to get into, a, get into this boat, and set it out a little into the water because he wanted to teach the crowds. After he was finished speaking, our Lord said to Peter, go out into the deep, duke and altum, and let down your nets. But Peter told him, Lord, we've tried all night to catch something, but at your word, I'll let down the nets. At this moment, Peter felt like a failure. He was a fisherman and he failed, utterly failed, caught nothing. But our Lord didn't call Peter when he was a failure, when he had caught nothing. Instead, he told Peter to let down his net. Peter let down his net, and he pulled in a load that was bigger than he could handle. His nets broke. After which, Peter fell to his knees and said, Lord, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. And our Lord said, from now on, you'll be a fisher of men. Our Lord liberates us. He frees us. He gives us the satisfaction to our desire for happiness. And it's in this liberation, it's in this liberation where he then calls us. The two primary calls, you can say, in our life is that of holy matrimony and that of consecrated life. But it's only once we're liberated, only once we're liberated, where we're looking for nothing else to satisfy our desire for happiness, that we can truly hear, feel, experience this call. And this call is to, is to love. Of course, oftentimes we, we put an age limit on, on people making a decision and we push them sooner than they actually have this experience. That's one of my reasons for thinking that there's so many, there's a lack of vocations often is because we, we go by society standards. You know, 18, you go to college, 22, you leave college and we base everything off these standards. It's completely unnecessary. If you've ever seen two people in love, you would have noticed that, these, that the words they use when speaking to each other are often exaggerated. If I'm with you, I don't need anything else. I have you, and that's all, I, all I'll ever need. I don't care if I don't have a nice car, a big house, if you don't have a fancy job, or if I don't have a fancy job, because I have you. Christian faith is inseparable from love, and this love makes us free from our delusion that temporal, created things can satisfy this infinite longing for happiness in order so that we can now give ourselves to another completely without anything holding us back. A desire for a big house, nice car, lucrative job, status, none of that holding us back. When I had decided to enter religious life, I had to quit the bands that I was in in Nashville, I had to break up with my girlfriend, I had to do all sorts of things that were very painful for me emotionally. When I told uh, the band that I was you know, not gonna come back, that I was uh, you know, leaving to enter religious life. We were at Applebee's, we're having dinner. The bass player was the first one to respond. And he was a faithful Protestant. He did his, you know, Wednesday night men's groups and all that kind of stuff. And his answer, you know, still perplexed me, still perplexes me. Because he understood it better than all, even my Catholic friends. He told me that he was jealous of me. And I was like, I'm experiencing all this, you know, emotional distress and anxiety about whether or not I'm making the, the best decision. I'm, I'm leaving my girlfriend, I'm leaving this career that I, that I worked so hard for, that I wanted so badly for just a mere question. Is this my way? Is this my vocation? And so I just looked at him perplexed. And he said, I'm jealous of you because I've never found anything in my life that was worth leaving everything else for. What does it mean to believe have you ever found in your lives a person who, because of their love for you, because of your love for them, radically devalued everything else in life? The treasure buried in the field? 
the pearl of great price. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.